every team has their own wrestler. But this is for wrestlers everywhere. Wrestle hard. All right. Welcome back to the Mindset Monday podcast brought to you by Wrestling Mindset, the only wrestling-specific mindset training program anywhere in the world. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and make sure to mention today's podcast with Dan Dennis when you sign up for your free trial session at WrestlingMindset.com. So this is Mindset Mike here, and I'm joined today by a guy tabbed as the wild man by Flow Wrestling. Interesting enough, by himself, his comeback journey from living out of his car to making the 2016 Olympic team is one of the most interesting you will ever hear. We'll talk about his time at Iowa, his hiatus from wrestling. Uh, some of the tough losses and experiences that he's had through his career, how he needed to defeat his teammate Tony Ramos to earn a spot on the Olympic team, and how he's trying to grow wrestling in Tennessee. So let's welcome today's guest, Dan Dennis. Thanks for joining us today, brother. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, I'm excited. So, you know, let's talk about your Iowa days. You know, you came in as an under-the-radar recruit from what I read, and, you know, you finished your freshman year actually with a losing record but really impressed the coaches and your teammates with your work ethic. Um, I found a quote from Mark Perry saying, um, if it's there and even if it's not there, he goes for it. I like watching him more than anybody else on the team. So talk to us about your time at Iowa and talk to us about what changed from having a losing record your freshman year to finishing off uh, as a two-time All-American. Um, well, starting at my freshman year, um, freshman year was hard. It was really hard for me to step in. I actually ended up starting as a true freshman and, uh, it was, it was a test. I, uh, I didn't have a very good career. I, I was coming out of high school, thought I was pretty good. Um, and it was a pretty rude awakening to, to step in as a true freshman and get beat up on quite a bit. And I mean, I remember going weeks without getting a takedown, um, just getting beat up and there was there was a lot of tests of making it through that freshman year even um for me personally um I remember a couple of times sitting against the wall going through hard workouts and not really not knowing if I could uh if I was going to be able to hang it out for another four years there um that was pretty hard for me but uh it was uh it was a pretty big test and I, I got to learn a lot from it and it was uh yeah it was a it was a rough year it was a pretty rough year for sure. So, you know, sophomore year, um, sophomore year and junior year, I know at one point you got hurt. You lost the season, correct? Yeah, I, I actually broke my jaw um, my third year in college. So I, I started as a true freshman, and then I, I actually took a red shirt when we had coaching change. And then the next year I uh, actually fractured my jaw and was out for the entire season. So the coaching change, was that when uh, brands came back? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, last year of uh, the old coaches, and that was Zaleski, Steiner, Hardtongue, um, Cliff Moore. I was a part of that group. So what was it like for that coaching change? Like, what was the difference in the dynamic between going from, you know, obviously a great, talented group of guys to come into, you know, the, you know, the, the iconic brands coming in to run your show? What was that like? Um, the intensity <laughs> ramped up a little bit, and that very could have, very well could have been just from a you know, new energy coming in as coaching staff. So that was, uh, it was, it was a lot and it was really intense. Um, it, it was, it was fun. It was an interesting change. It, it was, it was quite a big change actually. But, um, uh, when you look at it, the change was probably the biggest thing <laughs> to see in different faces and the intensity that they brought to it. Um, and I was pretty fortunate and ended up thriving what I, I feel like pretty well with, uh, with that change. So it was, it was good. It was a really positive change. For sure. So what was the difference between, you know, obviously besides experience, between you as a freshman and then becoming a two-time All-American? Like what, what changed for you like mentally and then in your development as a wrestler? Uh, I think for me it was uh, not worrying or looking too far ahead. Um, I get caught up if I look too far down the road on if, I'm, if I was tough enough to be able to stick it out. I remember that, that being a big issue for me. Uh, what really helped me the most was just trying to take it day at a time, one day at a time, um, focusing on the next workout on the time at the next workout at the time, not what's going to happen next week or next month or trying to plan out who's going to be in the spot or, you know, wor worrying about all these other outside factors that, that I have no control over. And really the only thing that I focused on, I don't know. I, I actually remember one time, um, 
with uh, with the coaches changing that really had a lasting impression on me was that I can't control um, a lot of my training and that I had to put had to put my trust in the coaches and had to put every bit of energy behind of what they said and just training with what I believed was right. What do you think it takes an athlete to put their full trust in their coaches? You know, when I was with Valentin Kalik at the Olympic Training Center, he said, I, you know, I asked him, I said, what's the most important thing that an athlete needs to do to be successful? And he said, trust your coaches. And I feel like that really doesn't happen a lot. You know, I mean, as a high school club coach myself, you could see the kids that listen to everything that comes out of your mouth. You could see the kids that listen to most things, but not everything. And then everybody else kind of listens to what you say and they kind of do their own version of whatever you think, whatever they think is best. So obviously only one group of those tend to be more successful. So, you know, what, what do you, what do you think is the importance of putting that full trust in your coaches? Well, the importance in it is, is important because you're trusting people that have done it before. Um, I had coaches that had been through highs and lows and, they, they would explain, you know, they'd break it down really well and relate to you what you're going through and uh, what to focus on. And, and it, I think having that relate is, uh, is really, really important. And I was fortunate enough to have that in the coaches and all the coaches that I had, even, even the first group of coaches that I had at Iowa, I was extremely trusting in what they were telling me. And I was, I was going through, you know, at that time, I was probably pretty young and maybe going through the motions a little bit, but I was trying to go through them. Um, maybe not as hard as I could have and should have, but I was working there. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing. So what did you focus on when you wrestled? You know, you said you put your trust in your coaches and, you know, they told you some things to focus on. What, what were those things that you focused on when, you're met, when you would wrestle? Like, you know, what would be your in-match goals? Um, are we talking match or uh, training? Uh, uh, let's uh, say both. So let's start with the match. Um, match. Match is just going out there with what the coaches are telling you to go out there with. I mean, that's the only thing that I was focusing on. What makes me the best wrestler? And for me, it was I wasn't super slick. It was my pace, getting my hands on a guy and making him feel me. Um, I know me as a person when I'm, I'm not the quickest, um, I'm not the slickest at all. Um, a lot of it is for me personally, just getting my hands on a guy and making sure that he feels me. And that's when I feel like I'm in most control. And that's what, you know, luckily my coaches were able to see and kept encouraging. And I, I man, I really don't like when I, when I lose or when I feel like I'm, I'm better than a guy and I'm, and I don't. And I don't out outperform him, um, and it would eat at me a lot. Like it, going home after a match or after a practice, just kind of self analyzing myself. I think was I probably did a lot, maybe to an unhealthy degree with some things, but I think that that really helped me with with really focusing on the adjustments that I need to make to get the results I want. You know. I got you. Um, so you said those are your in match goals. You know, get your uh, get your pace up, put your hands on them, don't stop moving. What what were your things that you focused on during training? Because you're you're talking a lot about trusting the process, trusting your coaches. What does that look like for you? Um, for me, that was try, trying, trying. Um, and I uh, I remember my high school coach was like, man, in, in in practice, I was like, man, I just can't figure out. I can't figure out. Like on top, um, I remember in high school, I kept uh, I kept trying to trick guys, like trying to be slick or if something wouldn't work and I was met with a little bit of resistance, um, that I need to go to something else. And a lot of times, I think as young athletes, we uh, we get resisted a little bit and we think we have to we have to do something else. Um, and I think that that can be it can take you out of your own out of your own best attributes as an athlete um, and just staying the course and listening to, to what the coaches were saying and, and, and doing some self research and watching stuff. And man, I know I'm in good position. Why can't I turn this guy? I'm doing everything right. And it would frustrate me why I couldn't um, or why I couldn't score on a high crotch. I'll get to the legs, but I can't score. I just always get crotch lifted or my short uh, technical position. Um, and that would really eat at me and frustrate me that I wasn't 
getting the results that I thought I should have. Absolutely. So now something you and I were talking about before the call started was you struggled with confidence. You know, we were talking about how to, how to get confidence into youth athletes or how important that is. And, you know, just some different thought, thought some thought processes about it. Um, talk to me about what it was like to have a guy as good as you were, but to struggle with confidence before you would wrestle. How did you overcome that? And, and, and what were the struggles that you had? I think yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't have a, I don't have a uh, perfect answer for you. I, and I think that it comes over time and I think it comes with failing and I think it comes with making little adjustments on whether it's your effort or whether it's whether it's your your belief during competition or during practice. Um, I just I was I'm pretty simple. I'm pretty simple in the sense where I I, I want blinders on when I, I don't have things going my way. I really have to like self analyze why they're not going my way, and. Um, I, I guess that's not really the answer you're probably looking for. Um, developing that, I think, comes over time and being relaxed. I, I know now, I, I don't care who I'm wrestling, I, they can be way better than me. They can be much better than me. They can be the best guy in the world. But if I stick to where I'm good, yes. only where I'm good, um, and only in the positions that I wrestle. And when we venture into positions that I'm not familiar with or I don't know or I don't feel comfortable, I get out of there and go back to where I have had success and where I feel comfortable. I'm glad you said it like that. So one of the things that we talk about is, you know, your pace or no pace, your position or no position, your ties or no ties. Yeah. And that's something that wrestlers struggle with. I mean, especially in freestyle and Greco, you see guys – you know, um, they're wrestling someone that likes to, to be in an underhook position and they're sitting in an, un in, in, in an underhook position. The wrestling guys that like to be in an under over and they're sitting in an under over. Like, what are you doing? Get out and get to your own stuff. So that's kind of the crux between our, uh, behind our program. We talk about the predator mindset. And, you know, one of the things is having a laser focus on ourself. You know, we're only focused on what we need to do, what we're best at. And obviously, as things, as obstacles come up, you take care of them. But, you know, a lion is only focused on what's directly in front of them. And that's winning that position. Like, I, I, I want to win this position, which means I'm going to win this tie, which means I'm not going to sit in your tie. -up. I'm not going to be here if I don't want to be. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think about, um, you know, I, I, I wrestle in a two-on-one a lot. And I feel secure when I have a two-on-one. If a guy's attacking me and I'm comfortable – with holding their arm and I know that I'm not going to get scored on as long as I have control of that arm. As soon as that arm starts losing or I start, start, start slipping or I'm starting to lose it, I'll clear I'll, if I'm getting in danger or I'll go right back to it if I can. Um, it's just familiarity with yourself, right? I guess. Absolutely. So, you know, so we have uh, a number of different topics that we address in our curriculum. That's about 60 worksheets total. The most dense part of the curriculum is self-knowledge. So if we can learn to get the most out of ourselves, all the other performance uh, tips and tools, all of the other um, uh, peak performance exercises that we have, they, they, they flow really easy. Ultimately, what I'm getting at is once we learn to learn ourselves, that's the, that's the most important opponent that we need to conquer. Oh. Once we know how to conquer ourselves and how to get the most out of ourselves, you know, beating somebody else is easy. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. So um, who were you closest with during your time at Iowa? You know, whether it be the staff or team, who, who do you feel like you kind of became the closest to? Um, well, one of my good teammates, uh, Jay Borschel, I was really good friends with. He ended up being national champ. I was roommates with Alex Sertis. I learned a ton from him. I learned a, a astronomical amount from him. Um, and I think that, and, and, uh, my, my coach was, you know, Tom and Terry and Doug and Zadik and all those guys <clears throat> and, you know, teammates like Metcalf. I don't know. I was that guy that held myself to the standard that, I was being told I should be at and what I was seeing around me. And I was, I was fortunate enough to be around a bunch of high level guys. And I didn't want to be the one left out as, as silly as that sounds. Winning's kind of contagious. And I was put in that situation where we were, we were really, we were dominant um, when I was in school and 
I wanted to be dominant because I was seeing these other, maybe I'm a follower from that point of view, but that was something that I didn't want to be left out on. Yeah, I hear you. Um, you know, speaking of the greatness that you were surrounded by, I was known for toughness and grit. What changes did you see in yourself as a result of choosing the University of Iowa? So the Dan Dennis that walked in the door versus the Dan Dennis that came out and, you know, made an Olympic team. What, what, what were the differences that you saw in yourself? Um, not being in control of what I'm going through and only putting effort in that. Um, and what I mean by that, so I had a, I had a time and I was, something was eating at me my second year and I, I was, I was struggling. I mean, there was a couple of times once my freshman year and I was just getting really frustrated my second year where I was like, man, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm cut out for this stuff. And, um, I, I always, I, I think I was kind of a little bit of a control freak when I didn't know how the workouts were going. I, I needed to know, and I would obsess over, I wouldn't obsess over it, but I would, it would, it would change my wrestling if I didn't. And, uh, there was a time I told one of my uh, coaches in, um, uh, in the warm up area. And, uh, I was like, man, I just need to know how long the goes are. I just want to know. I'd give anything to know how long the goes are. And, uh, and that got back to our head coach and he made a big, big deal of that comment. Um, and a light switched off or a light switched on. Um, when he, he confronted, he gra he ran up to me, Tom ran up to me, grabbed my arm one morning when I was coming in for a morning lift and he grabbed my arm, held out and he karate chopped me <laughs> like right at my shoulder. And I was like, ow, he's like, and he's furious. I mean, <clears throat> he was absolutely furious. And I didn't know what was going on. And, uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry about the dog got out. And, uh, and he was like that, would you give that? I was like, what are you talking about, Tommy's like, I'm going to take your arm, and I, and then I'm going to tell you every single go how long it's going to be, what we're going to be doing. Every practice, I'll give you the notes. And I'm like, well, no, no I wouldn't. I, I was pretty – I took it pretty literal. It's like, no, I wouldn't give my arm, Tom. That was a stupid question. And uh, and then he, like, went down to my elbow. He's like that. And, and he ended up going all the way down my arm, and he ended up grabbing my pinky nail at one point, I think. And was like, how about I just take this nail? How about that? And I'll tell you how long every go is. And throughout that, I was like, man, a little light bulb went off. And I was like, I guess I'm not in control here. I, I'm, I'm not in control of what the workouts are, what we're going through. The only thing I'm in control of is how hard I work during that. Um, and I think that that really helped me ramp up my training. And I think it, it was a point in time where I learned a lot. And now I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable now not knowing how long the workout is. I've been through really, really long, hard workouts, and however long they go, I'm, I'm just wrestling as hard as I can until that workout's over, and I think that's, that was a big changing point for me. Absolutely. So I think I, what I get from that is fo being able to focus on what you can control. And we talked mm -hmm. about that beforehand, which is, you know, effort, attitude, and aggressiveness. So what does that mean to you? You know, being able to focus on what you can control, you, you've said it in different ways a couple times now. Yeah. How, how, how would you encourage people to focus on what they can control? So again, so like we talk about effort, attitude, and aggressiveness. What would you say are within a wrestler's control, whether it be training or competition? What are the things to focus on? Oh, your your what your goals are. Um, what you want out of the sport, right? If you want to be a national champ, it's gonna be a hard it's gonna be a hard road being a national champ if you're in wrestling, if you're up all night playing video games or out at out hanging out with friends and it, like doing your social life, putting that ahead of, of your training and what you really wanna accomplish. I think and not in an unhealthy way, but I think that you have to really put your your goals in priority i mean if you have a goal to be the best in a sport it takes a lot you can't be you can't be stupid to think that it you know just or you have to be stupid if you think people just wind up waking up and stumbling on top of a podium um it takes a lot of work and seeing that and being exposed to that is something that's crazy valuable and seeing how people accomplish that all all in different ways but it's a dedication. Um, it's a big dedication and commitment to want to be the best at that, at any sport. For sure. So um, 
Let's talk about, you know, one of the – you were talking about you didn't like losing. Well, this was definitely a loss that was really tough for you. 2010, you made the NCAA finals against Jason Ness, and you lost in the final seconds. This loss was obviously tough on you. Um, you know, it was, it's something that's, that's been talked about, you know, for years since. Can you talk us through that loss, what it meant for you, like what, it, what the impact that it had on you, and, you know, kind of how you did or didn't deal with it? Um, I mean, that was, that was my world collapsing. Uh, that was, I put my heart and soul into accomplishing that and being so close. And I mean, I wrestled as hard as I could outside of the last probably 20, 30 seconds, which I was blatantly stalling. Um, that, that was hard. It was, it was a really hard loss after the match. I remember running off the stage, going back behind the curtains and just falling apart, being a puddle of mush. And, um, it, it was everything falling apart. You put so much into effort and energy and attention and commitment into wanting to achieve something. And, and then having that slip right through your hands, um, is, is really painful, you know? And I probably didn't deal with it great after I, I, I wasn't training phenomenally after I didn't have a very good international career in the immediate years after, but, um, it was something that I learned a lot from <clears throat> and I ultimately had to take a break, um, before coming back on the mat. It, it, it was a pretty hard, it was a really hard time for me. Um, yeah. How, how do you feel like you were able to get through it? Like what, what was there like certain people? Was there something you did or didn't do? Like, you know, how, how did you make yeah, it I, through such a devastating loss? Cause that was something you worked for your whole life and it was taken away from you with, you know, in a matter of 10 seconds. Yeah. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to have the coaches I had. Um, after that, I kind of went AWOL for a little bit and, uh, didn't deal with it great. And I was, I was pretty down. I was really down. Um, and I think that I know, uh, I remember one morning Tom came in and after a long night out and, uh, Tom's like, Hey man, you got to get your head out of your ass. And, um, he, he, having people around you <clears throat> that are able to see who you are and know, know <laughs> what you're capable of and, and all those things, I think that I was extremely fortunate to have have those, have those be my coaches. And they, uh, they held me extremely accountable. And, uh, it was, it was a fortunate situation looking back at it now. You know, I, I've heard stories from different athletes at Iowa, like how hands-on, uh, those coaches are, you know, Tom and Terry are really, really a lot more hands-on than maybe people would give them credit for it because they're such hard-nosed guys. Can you, can you talk a little bit about like the Tom and Terry that everybody doesn't see? Yeah. The Tom and Terry that every, that people don't see or recognize is that they're crazy extreme competitors. Um, as competitive as anyone you'll ever meet more so, but they're more than that. And if you're being detrimental and unhealthy for yourself, they don't, they, that's unacceptable. And, um, those coaches are, I mean, if you're, if you're slacking off in school, you're not practicing until you get your grades fixed. Um, they'll do that. If you're dragging ass in recovery and if you have a little injury and you're not doing your rehab, you're, you're required, you're like, they're going to get you in there, make sure that you're doing those right things to get you back in the right mindset to go out and compete. Um, it's a lot more than wrestling at Iowa. And I think that we kind of get a bad name for that or we don't get acknowledged for that. And it's a little frustrating, but it is what it is. Yeah. So when we, when we talk about the Iowa mindset, obviously everybody thinks of like forward pressure, pace, uh, being aggressive, relentless. What, what would you say would be like the mantras or the mindset of the Iowa wrestling team? When, when you can coach someone, when Tom, Tom's head coach at Iowa, when, you, when he can coach someone like Mark Perry, and get two two national titles out of him, who's what not an Iowa style, the typical Iowa style wrestler. And then you can coach someone like Brent Metcalf. Those two are on kind of polar opposite ends of the spectrum as far as com competitors, or not, not as far as competitors, as far as like wrestlers. Um, so I, I feel like I feel like Tom 
does an extremely good job at getting the most out of his athletes, no matter who they are. It could be a John Smith style wrestler and Tom will hone in on those positives, you know, on, on what that athlete has his strong points at. And I think that that's, that's really important. So Tom does a really good job of getting the most out of the potential of the guys that he gets. Yeah. So let's talk about some guys that he's going to get that have potential. You know, you saw Spencer Lee come back from an ACL injury and has a phenomenal national tournament. And now, you know, he's going to have Austin DeSanto as a teammate. You know, that's a, um, you know, call, call him for whatever he is. You know, everyone's got lots of different opinions. What is, what is someone like that look like coming into, like, what do you expect the DeSanto career to look like under Tom Brands? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm, I'm excited to see how that career turns out. You, you can't put everything on, on the coach as well. Um, I, I think DeSantos is a extremely tough wrestler, but uh, I, uh, you can't, you can't tell what, how an individual is going to react to any program. Um, I, I'm excited and looking forward to see, see his career unfold there. Um, I'm, I'm really excited for it, and I would only expect for him to continue to grow under, under that coaching staff. I think it's a good fit, wouldn't you agree? I mean, just the kind of way his relentless pace, his, oh, his really tough style. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine him anywhere else. When he went to Drexel, I was like, I don't get it. Yeah, yeah, he, he wrestles really hard. Um, I think that that's only going to continue. Um, I think that they'll only, you know, encourage that more and more, and I'm, I'm excited to see see the changes that he makes too. For sure. Um, so you graduated in 2010. Mm-hmm. What did you do from there before you decided to take that hiatus from wrestling? Cause that, cause that, cause, cause that took some time, right? It wasn't right after graduation. Yeah. I, I stayed for two, two and a half years um, after I graduated and I was, I was trying to compete. Um, I was cutting down a weight class. I was cutting quite a bit of weight and, I, like I said, I was probably at a point, I, I think I let my, you know, last match in college kind of affect me too much in probably a negative way. And my training wasn't the way it was in, in college when I was, fo- I mean, I was laser focused in college. My biggest vice, I think, in college was staying up too late playing a Bejeweled or something um, during season. That was like one of the biggest distractions probably. Uh, <laughs> And when I graduated, I, I, I wasn't training like I should have been. I wasn't focused on on competing and getting the most out of myself. I was probably sulking and being a little bit of a crybaby looking back at it now. And that was that was hard. I wasn't having the results I wanted. I dropped a weight, and I thought that I was going to be bigger and stronger, and I wasn't doing it the right way. And I, I wasn't nutritionally doing it the right way and training-wise and uh, wasn't having the results I wanted. And my body was getting beat up, and it was just – it wasn't a good situation where my mind was at. So yeah, it was rough. So fast forward to the week that you decided to pack up your truck and drive away. Talk us through that. And ultimately what made you leave? Like, what did it take for you to think that this was the best option for you? Uh, I was, I don't like using the the word burnt out, but I, I I wasn't in the right mindset to, to train. And it was, it was it was rough leaving. It was home for a really long time, but I felt like it was I was beating a dead horse a little bit, and uh, I, I wasn't being productive for myself. And ultimately, if you're not if you're not productive for yourself, it's going to be a hard time for true, you know, um, results to happen for other people. And that's kind of just hanging around, being a training partner, and it wasn't. It wasn't the ideal situation for, for me, and I just was kind of kind of over it at the time. So I, I felt the need to take off, and Tom 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 didn't want to see me go. We actually had some we had some arguments about leaving, and uh, and rightfully so. I uh, so it was it was rough leaving Iowa City. I just kind of you know was burnt out and needed to move on and uh, found myself in California. Well, found myself doing a lot of climbing and then making my way out to California and coach out there for a little bit. So, t- so tell us the journey. So you, you, you pack up your truck and where do you go first? I actually loaded up my truck. Um, I had everything I owned in a 86 Ford F-150. It was a <laughs> hunk of crap I bought for $600. 
and uh, I had everything that I owned in the back of it. And I actually had some climbing friends that I leaving. I we drove out to Utah, and I I went I just went climbing. They uh, we went on a little climbing trip. They flew back, and I wound up staying and camping and climbing for I think it was like eight or nine months, and uh, nah, maybe not quite about like seven eight months and uh and then just moved on to actual career a uh, job where i could find one and i was just at a local high school where was that at in california northern california what school uh santa or uh, windsor windsor high school windsor north of the, yeah about an hour north of san francisco gotcha gotcha yeah my my um my only experience with california has been um i was at the monterey coaches clinic and then I were I did some work with uh, some of the wrestlers in Selma, but that's like uh, that's like Fresno area. Mm -hmm. So actually, I guess it, that's not too far from San Francisco. Not horrible, no. That stays like fourteen hours if you drive it. <laughs> uh, you, you're you're telling me. So like, I actually I spent a week in California, and I went from an hour east of LA to Monterey, which is north, like three hours of Fresno. So yeah. I drove everywhere, and I had to drive back to LA. Because I just I, I, I couldn't I had to return the rental, so <laughs> they they wouldn't let me return it anywhere else. So, anyways, um, so California. So you're out in California, um, and I guess my question is, you know, being a high caliber wrestler, you kind of have to be a goal oriented person. During that time away from the sport, did your goals shift to different areas of your life and? You know, or was this a period of time where you mainly used to recover physically and mentally to rebuild yourself? Uh, definitely recovering. Um, when I left Iowa City, I had like I was actually worried. I was more worried about climbing and camping and doing other things than any wrestling. I was I was checked out and done with wrestling um, when I left, and I needed that break. My I, re I had a lot of nerve damage. My left arm, my arm had like, I mean, half strength of my right arm. It was shriveled and. I was beat up. I was really beat up, and it, it was definitely a recovery for my mind more than anything, but my body needed it too. I gotcha. Um, at what point did you decide to come back? You know, who, who, who or what had the biggest impact on getting you there? Um, <laughs> the c coaches. I remember leaving. I, I went and stayed about two weeks in uh, Indian Creek and didn't have any cell phone service at all, and when I, uh, when I pulled out of the valley, it, uh, my phone just blew up with a bunch of, I mean, obviously you're gone for two weeks. You still have friends and, uh, voicemails and texts and all that. And one, I remember one standing out, Tom called me all excited and, uh, he was talking about the rule changes and, you know, freestyle rules change all the time. He's like, Hey, and when I, leaving, he didn't want me to leave. He always wanted me to stay He for whatever reason. Um, and when I remember getting that phone call or listening to that voicemail and him being like, hey, get whatever you need out of you. Go climb, go run around, camp, hike, whatever you need, but get your ass back here. These rule changes are going to encourage your wrestling. This is good for you. We got to we got to take advantage of this. Come on. Like he was very encouraging of me coming back and competing. And I just kind of washed it off and didn't really pay any mind to it. And. I kept getting I, – I would always go back to Iowa City just for – I had family and friends there, you know. I mean, what feels like family. And um, and every time I'd go back, I'd scrap with, you know, Metcalf or wrestle with the the 33-pounders, Clark or Gilman or someone, and um, giving them fits and still wrestling and competing. And all the coaches being like, dude, what are you doing? Get your ass back on the mat. Let's get into competition. And I just kind of washed it off for two years. And I just, I was living in a trailer in California. And I remember sitting there one night and uh, looking at results, who was doing what and seeing w how well people were doing and really thinking like, man, I think I could have beat, I think I can beat that guy. And uh, it really just started as, as, just like that, just asking thinking about the guys that were having success and feeling like I could do that and that I, I was at that level. Um, and really just ultimately it was, uh, it was, a, my dad was going through some health issues. He ended up passing of uh, brain cancer and I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it was, it was a rough time, but, uh, that was kind of, uh, my dad had always been an extremely supportive person of my wrestling and, 
it uh, it was one of those questions, and that probably added to it, you know. And uh, I remember I was back home visiting one summer, and my mom and I were sitting at the table just playing cribbage or something. And and I asked my mom. It, it was just after my dad had passed, and I asked my mom like, "Yeah, hey, I was thinking these guys are trying to get me to compete." Yeah, I was just kind of making light of it, seeing what she was going to say. And I remember her just looking up and being like, well, your dad sure would, lo- sure would love to enjoy it, like to- would have loved to watch it. And that was one of those things where I was like, man, well, shit, now I guess I got to at least try one competition. So I, I wrestled at the U.S. Open, and I ended up taking fourth qualifying for the world team trials that year. And uh, at the – I. I was planning on only one tournament. I was only planning on wrestling at the U S open just kind of as a personal test and um, qualifying for the world team trials. After that, I I wasn't even planning on going to it and then ended up going there, taking second. And then it was a really big choice on if I'm going one more year and and my weight uh, got taken away for the Olympic year. So I would have had to drop one more weight. And uh, that was a big question and big commitment and coaches were not Gonna take no for an answer, um, so I ended up sticking around for one more year and ended up making that that team. So, what was the difference between you, twenty fifteen with the fourth place finish at the U.S. Open versus you know the twenty sixteen at the U.S. Open? What, what did what was the differences in how you competed? I think just time back on the mat. When I came back, um, I, I remember both the coaches, Tom and Terry. Terry specifically was like, "Hey." I went through this. I, I, I went an extra four years than my brother. I, I had to train way different and realizing that you can train to your age and train to really what suits you best. And uh, I had coaches that encouraged that a lot. And instead of getting live on the mat every day and going through a grind every day, like I used to in college, like I used to be able to in college, it turned into, Hey, you got to make sure your body's feeling good. And now you have to – you just got to train smarter. And that was, uh, that was something that it took me a little bit of time to learn, but it, it was uh, ultimately a, a great lesson, you know, and I was able to figure out how I, I personally need to train. Gotcha. So what, I guess what advice would you give to people that are coming through going from the transition from college to open competition? It's, it's definitely a very different grind. That's something that I, that I said uh, that I share with my athletes is something that I noticed that successful college guys do that um, – I'm sorry, that um, the senior level guys and girls do much better than the college guys is they grind smarter, not harder. They recover a lot more. They take more breaks. They train hard, but they don't, they don't, we don't beat the crap out of our bodies like we did in college. So I guess outside of that, what, what advice could you give to people that are making that transition? Um, staying focused on what you want to accomplish and where you're, um, I think really seeing where, what holes you have is, uh, and that's going back to like, uh, you know, learning how to compete yourself or conquering yourself. Right. But um, I think that that was something like any, any holes that I have in my, in my technical training is something that I was able to have the coaches around me to point out and to show you what you need to work on. And uh, being committed to working on them was, was really a big thing for me. It's a whole new level. It's a whole new, it's a whole new style, you know, and it takes a little bit of time to gain that experience that you really – that you really need to compete at it. I gotcha. Um, so <clears throat> let's fast forward now to the Olympic trials. You know, obviously you decided to stick it out another year. At, at, at what point, you know, I, I, I don't know the logistics of how all that came about, but you know, when you and Tony figured out that you were going to be going the same weight, like what, what kind of happened? Um, what was the, what was the vibe that you guys were going to have to compete against each other? Uh, the vibe was, it was a little, I don't want to say awkward. It was, it was, no, it wasn't, it wasn't at all. Actually, it was, it was focused on, we were both focused on our, in our own little world, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we both knew we were, were tough guys that were pretty high on the rankings for that weight. Um, but we, we kind of, we kind of kept to our own little, our own little bubble, I guess, from a training standpoint. Um, we, we didn't wrestle at all ever. 
once I, uh, once I made that commitment down to 57, um, I think he took it as a threat, which is fair to take. Um, so we just kind of, we kind of stayed on our own course. There was a little bit of tension, um, during it, obviously there turned out to be a lot of tension, but, um, it was, uh, it was something that I didn't really pay much mind to. I'm, I'm pretty selfish. I, I, I remember Tom talking about if you take care of yourself, the team aspect will take care of, will take care of itself. And, uh, that resonated with me. And I, I, I'm pretty selfish as far as a, a training standpoint where the best thing I can do for, for a team is win, right. And how dominant I can do that. And that's kind of, that was kind of my mindset the whole time. I don't know if that really answers your question, but I, I pretty, I stayed pretty focused on that. For sure. So, you know, let's talk about the match at the Olympic trials. So obviously you won. There was a lot of, you know, there's, there was a lot of mess that came after that. Um, how did that affect you, if at all, moving forward in your training? I mean, obviously you and Tony were teammates and he took that very heavily, you know, obviously ultimately, you know, left Iowa, goes to North Carolina. Did that have any effect on, on your training or did that, you know, bother no, you for that, five that minutes? Was, that, yeah, that was after I, I kind of, I've known Tony for a really long time and for one incident like that to ruin our relationship, mm -hmm. it would be, would be silly. For um, sure. He was somebody that he brought me over as a training partner overseas. Um, I, I remember one time I drove out to Co Colorado and slept in my car because I couldn't get a room at the training center um, to be his training partner. I mean, we, we, we had a relationship that lasted much long, a very long time that a lot of people don't, don't really know or understand and, and they shouldn't. Um, but that stuff doesn't, doesn't really bother me. He, he had something on his mind that he felt he had to get off his chest and uh, something that I don't agree with, but it doesn't mean that I'm, you know, hold anything against him. He, he's a tough competitor. He's a, he always has been and always will be in every area of his life. Um, it didn't really affect me really at all. Um, cool. Still them as the same. For sure. Now, speaking of, you know, getting caught up in, in, in hype, I, I've heard you talk about how people get too caught up in social media. What does social media, what, what effect does social media have on our wrestlers today and how could they maybe handle it better? You know, social media is a slippery slope. Um, it can be used for good and it can be used for, it, it it can have its effects of just being complete and total BS. And I, I'm, I'm a pretty personal guy. Um, I don't, I don't like putting out like training. Training is a very personal thing to me. I, I don't want, I don't like other people knowing what I do or what it, what I feel it takes to do well or be good. Mm -hmm. It's a really personal thing. I, I've just never been that guy that, like broadcasting everything. I, I think we get caught up in, in the distractions of it. And I, I, I don't know. I have a weird feeling on that, I guess. Well, talk more about it. You know, obviously this generation struggles with it. To be honest, I think social media is a tremendous contributor to the lack of mental fortitude in our athletes. You know, just the, just the, the millennial age of, you know, getting so caught up in records and rankings and this guy wrestled this guy who wrestled that guy, um, you know, seeing what other people say, you know, listening to predictions or hearing, hearing somebody on flow say that, oh, I don't think this person's going to win has an effect on people. So how, how could this generation maybe out, out, outside of packing up their car and moving to the mountains, how could they deal with social media better? <laughs> you know, like, um, Social media is the best of everything. So everyone lives in this world of glamour and everything's easy. And this guy, he wins because he's, I don't know, training. Uh, they'll like post videos of their training up. That, that's, that's not all what it takes. Um, and it can be misleading. It can be really misleading. And, and I think that we, we fall into that a lot, as, especially as young athletes. And they're growing up with that being the normal. I mean, some of these kids think that I, everyone has an iPhone, you know, and uh, that's a standard thing. And everyone should be on social media and living our lives through that. And uh, 
it's just a to me it's an unhealthy unrealistic display of what reality is um, when you can just pick and choose what you want to post or yeah it, or what you want to read it it's not the actual experiences of what it takes to really meet those things of what you for want. sure for sure you know the the hype and the fan mentality destroys a lot of people i think and people that, get caught up in that too you know yeah. someone posts like oh spencer lee's not he talking bad about him or good about him if he were to be that individual which he's not but if he were to be that individual that put a lot of stock into what other people say that he has no idea who they are that that can be pretty negative i think and unhealthy absolutely so you are a pretty simple guy um this is this is i'm gonna mention this because it's somehow gotten brought up on like a handful of occasions to include like preparing for this podcast um as 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 a uh, accomplished of a wrestler you are, for whatever reason, people always notice that you're wearing mat flexes. You know, you're, <laughs> you're such you're a simple guy you wearing know, like an intro wrestler's shoes. Like, what's what's up with that? Here, so when, Doug Schwab turned me on to mat flexes. Actually, the best shoe ever is mat flex one. If anyone has a nine and a half, I will pay a good coin for them. Um, <laughs> seriously, I will. Um, you know what I really loved? I loved going to camps. Matt Flexes are the shoes that no one can afford, right? Like, they're, they were $25 when they came. They're an entry-level shoe. If you really think a shoe is going to make you a better wrestler, you're an idiot. You're, you're an absolute <laughs> idiot. I'm sorry to say that. Um, and I, it, it, it drips well. It's a good shoe. And I don't care what it costs. I loved going to camps and seeing the kids that – you know, we didn't have the money or their parents didn't have the money to buy them the, I mean, shoes nowadays are 150 bucks for a nice pair. They really are. And, yeah. I loved going to camps, seeing the kids who couldn't afford mat flexes and them feeling bad about, it. I mean, people would actually like, Oh, th like not feel good about the shoes they wear. It's so like, you know what? That's the best shoe on the market. I love that. Cause wrestling's a blue collar sport. You don't need anything other than a little bit of work ethic, a lot of work ethic in commitment it doesn't matter what shoes you're wearing and that that's really a, a lot of why i wear matte flexes and for what i like a, a, a flexible shoe and that's one of the most flexible sock like feeling shoes out there so i just keep running with them i love them that's too if, funny if i can get them to make the original ones I'll, I'll i'll start a campaign to bring those back too hey man if, if uh, you decide to compete again i guarantee you asics will bring back matte flexes for you oh man I might do that. <laughs> <laughs> you just, just, just one more go around. One more go around, and we'll have the Matt Flex 3.0. If we can get the original Matt Flex design out, I might. I would probably do that. That's too funny. <laughs> so, speaking of competing, what what made you decide you were um, done competing in Rio? You know, obviously, you achieved such a great goal to go from not, you know, from leaving wrestling behind to you know making an olympic team and actually here i'm gonna pull up a, i'm gonna pull up a quote that i found um i'm gonna see if i still have it and it was something Jaden cox said about you Jaden's a great guy I love that guy while, while i while i find this quote tell me a little bit more tell me a little bit more about your relationship with Jaden. Oh, Jane, I got a room with him uh, a couple of times, but we the longest room was when we were in uh, Rio. And he is one of the most interesting guys you'll meet. I mean, the guy plays so many instruments. I, we'd, I'd come back from, uh, from practice and he'd have his iPad out and uh, he'd be playing the piano on his iPad. And he'd be picking strings on it with some app and trying to play um, – whatever guitar or something i don't know what it was but he's extremely talented there's so much more to Jaden than i mean obviously he's got that flow documentary out that kind of explains it a little bit more um gives you a better idea but he's an extremely interesting guy and crazy talented outside of wrestling outside of outside of wrestling as well you know i met him at uh the beat the streets gala um two years ago in new york city and I, I didn't know that he could sing. I didn't know anything about that. All of a sudden, I see him come up on stage. And I was like, wow, yeah. there is a lot Lights. more to that kid. And, and yeah. then and it was amazing. And then I see him at the California Coaches Clinic a year later. And he's an amazing teacher. He yeah. did a really yeah. great job teaching. Yeah. 
So he breaks I, things down really well and explains them explains them really well. Really well. And just, you know, he was a character. Hands down stole the show at the California Coaches Clinic. And that was alongside guys like Fretwell, Zeke Jones, Mike Krause. Like, hands down, Jaden Cox stole the show. Nice. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> so his quote that I found was he was talking about you. And he said, he's the fight and he's the fire. He comes to practice every day with the attitude that he's going to rip you to shreds. And that's exactly how it's going to be. Did you ever <laughs> see that? I didn't see that. that. That's flattering, though. That's cool. <laughs> so, what do you think about that? That I'm. That makes me feel good. Um, that's that's what I want to be known as, man. I I, I want to be known as someone who tries really hard and leaves everything out there. You know, I, I might not be the most talented or gifted or slickest or fastest or strongest, but. I just want to try really hard, and as long as I do that, I can hang my hat on it and and be okay with the results. May, even if I'm not okay, I can still live with them, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, pull, I'm pulling up my notes here again. So I guess let's, let's, let's go back to what we were saying. You know, you competed in Rio. Your first match didn't go the way that you wanted. The guy didn't make the final, so did he, you, you didn't get to continue. Um, what was the journey like? from making the team to getting to Brazil? Um, it was a lot of training. I mean, we had a couple of competitions. Getting to know the guys, um, the co- the coaches. I mean, my relationship with Tom and, and Terry and all, all the coaches really, really thrive. Um, our strength and conditioning coach, I started, <laughs> he started putting me through lifts a bunch and just really being focused in a collaborative effort of other guys – putting a lot into you too. Um, it made it hard after I lost. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't how I wanted, how I envisioned it to happen. I felt like I was better than that guy. Um, and I, you know, you have a little bit of, you feel like you let people down and it, it that, that kind of, that did suck. That was rough, but it, it really in the training and everything that went along with it to get to that point, it, you you build a lot stronger relationships with the people around you that are helping and really want the same thing for you. It, it was I remember after I won the the trials, um, my sister started a GoFundMe page for for our family to make it down. We're not the most well off people, and and we needed to get funds to get everyone down. And it, the support from the the fans of Iowa, that thing filled up in like. 24 48 hours like met its goal just it, it blew up and that, that was it's it's humbling you know it, it really is knowing that that many people support you and it, that's it was, pretty cool yeah what was your favorite part of the olympic journey you know from start to finish what was your favorite favorite part um that's a good question <laughs> um I don't know, being able to travel and see, see the world. Uh, I felt like I've been exposed to a lot of it and uh, taking that and taking that with you is, is an experience that, you know, I wouldn't have had without that. Absolutely. So I guess let's, let's go back to the original question of what made you decide to not compete after you were done in Rio? Um, I don't know. I'm 31 and just kind of beat up and not, not, not in the mindset. I'm trying to give back and now allow others to learn from my mistakes and try to continue to grow and and give back to now the the current wrestlers and helping them meet their goals. I'm I'm just not in the competition mindset when when your body gets beat up and I know what it takes to get to that level and the training that it takes. It's just not it's not there right now and it, it's yeah it's. It's a lot of it's a lot of work. Um, so I, I got two questions before we kind of go through like the little mindset quick fire of some you know some basic mindset uh, 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 question that I like to ask every guest. But you know you said you know what it takes to to com- be competitive at that level and you know the mindset that it takes and you weren't there. So what what does it take to compete at that level and what is that mindset? The commitment of getting better and focusing on the fine details of what it takes for you to be on the top, and I'm I'm just not at that I'm not at the age where I can do that anymore. Um, but I think that that's that's a that's a lot. You know, the training aspect is is really heavy, and to train the way that I I feel like I need to to be prepared to compete, it would probably be more than what my body's capable of now. 
Gotcha. I gotcha. Um, so last thing for those of you that don't know, Dan has moved out to Tennessee um, yeah. and you started a club. And I'm is in, that- in the process of doing that. It's going to be going out. It's going to start enrollment in the fall. Gotcha. Well, you, you, you have a little something going on in Tennessee. Which part? Um, right outside Chattanooga. Yeah, right actually, outside Chattanooga. Yeah, going to be running um, actually out of the UTC room for the first year. Oh, that's awesome. So where are you right now where you're running practices? I'm at, at the UTC room, yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. I did group right now, though, just keeping it that way for the summer, and then in the fall we'll, we'll start actual groups and, and, all, and all that. Well, if you're listening and you're in Tennessee, you know where to find good training now because I'm sure, yeah. uh, you know, whether it be, you know, you're at, if you're up in Nashville, Mike Chandler, uh, Bellator, undefeated, uh, longtime Bellator fighter, University of Missouri All-American. He's up there. You've got Dan Dennis now right outside the Chattanooga room. You've got the Chattanooga room, yeah. guys you could practice with. So, you know, Tennessee is definitely going to be coming up here in the next couple of years. I'm excited um, to see that. So I guess my last question is, what made you want to leave? You know, you said you were done competing. What made you choose to leave and go to Tennessee of all places? Uh, it's beautiful out here. It's absolutely beautiful. Driving through here and around. I mean, been traveling around a lot this summer or uh, this this winter and uh, just found home here. Uh, great connections and it's absolutely beautiful here. So it's somewhere where I see myself for a while. That's awesome. What's your favorite part about Tennessee so far? Um, you know, I'm still new to it. Uh, driving around here and just learning the area and finding out, you know, everything it has to offer. There's a bunch of climbing here that I that I see myself fa- falling into, and uh, there's a lot of water sport. It's just a beautiful area that I'm excited to explore. Awesome, man. Awesome. So before we get into this mindset quick fire, is there anything else that you wanted to share or wanted to clarify or wanted to add uh, for those those that are listening? No, just try to try to focus on on the things that actually matter. Um, and that's, you know, the closest, closest things around you and, and what your goals are and, uh, and pursuing those I think is really important. And we allow ourselves to get taken away and go different, different routes um, with how we feel like we should train or how we feel like we should, who we should hang out with, whatever it may be. Um, I think it's really important staying true to yourself and, staying true with what you foresee yourself doing and what it takes to get there. Absolutely. Well, as, uh, as I said, I've got some, I've got some questions for you. I hope everybody's paying close attention because these are things directly related to mindset that uh, a a great competitor, you know, like Olympian Dan Dennis, two time all American from Iowa, you could definitely learn from him. So let's start off with the most, one of the most important questions. What what is the importance of mindset in wrestling, and why do you feel like it's so important? I feel like it's so important because we, in wrestling, in a match especially, we can let outside factors play a role in in the outcome of a match that that shouldn't have any influence in that. And I think you know you do an amazing job at at you know kind of tr- preaching that that we need to focus on the the competition and the things that matter of you becoming, performing your best. Right. And I Mm -hmm. think that honing in on those things is so valuable that these other distractions don't, you don't allow them to have a role in, in the actual outcome of how you perform. I think is really important. I think you guys do a great job with that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I think, you know, once you've learned to be able to focus on what matters and what you can control, not just on the mat, but off the mat, your life becomes a lot easier, a lot simpler. You can deal with adversity much quicker, much more efficiently. You know, you don't get caught up in a bunch of BS. And, you know, through mindset training, you have the ability to use coping mechanisms to actually catch yourself instead of having to let yourself go through an awful downward spiral. Um so we have a number of topics, you know, our, our curriculum is systematic and it's broken down into self-knowledge, goal setting, confidence, mental toughness, uh, relaxing under pressure, present moment, clarity, aggressiveness. Uh, which of those do you feel like are the most important factors in an athlete's mindset? So, so I'll say it again, self-knowledge, confidence, goal setting, mental toughness, aggressiveness, present moment, clarity, um, I think I say, uh, make sure I say goal setting and uh, aggressiveness. For me personally, I think self-awareness and, and your effort. 
effort is huge. Effort is absolutely huge. And, and, and being able to make adjustments when you don't have the outcome you want, whether that's not even, not even, I'm not talking winning or losing. I'm talking a position, winning a position in a, not figuring out like when you're in on a leg and getting stuck in a wizard, why do you, why do we keep doing that? Being able to make adjustments and being able to analyze yourself, so self-awareness. And I would say effort, I think are the two biggest that stand out to me personally. For sure. So when we talk about giving a maximum effort, what does that look like? What, what does that look like? You know, besides trying your hardest, what does giving a max effort look like? Uh, I mean, there's so much involved in that, right? Like being smart as well, making adjustments. If I'm, ha if I have an opponent that's extremely good somewhere where I'm not, not wading into those waters. Um, I think that's really, really huge. Uh, just making those adjustments and, and learning from them and being able to retain that. Perfect. So coming from Iowa, obviously they're known for producing tough people. What's the difference between being mentally tough and being resilient? Being resilient and mentally tough. You, yeah, you can be mentally tough and do the exact same thing and continue to beat your head against the wall and that will, that'll fade over time. Um, I think being resilient and I think that goes along with making those adjustments and learning from them. I, I think that there's more to the word resilient than just, you know, toughness. Um, I, I think that's being revived with a new way to look at it and being able to receive other input from other coaches or other peers and making those adjustments and, and just not, not being satisfied and continuing to build, I think, is what, what I think of when I think resilient. For sure. You know, w there's been a handful of times where we'll talk to people and they'll be like, you know, they'll describe us as a toughness coach. And I said, no, this is not about toughness. Toughness is five worksheets out of 60. Toughness gets you through a workout. Toughness, <laughs> toughness allows you to overcome, you know, a, 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 a piece of adversity in front of you. But – you know, being able to be resilient, being able to have a stronger mindset allows you to do so much more than just be tough. That just what you just said kind of made me think of uh, an example, I guess, that came to my mind was resilient. If you, if you get injured, if I'm injured and I'm off the mat for three months, I, my senior year, I was off the mat for a couple of weeks. Or I was off the mat for a month and a half, I think. It might have even been two. Um, but I was learning. <laughs> I wasn't letting that injury you know, I wasn't letting that injury take away from my progress that I, I felt I needed to have. Um, watching videos and building your cardio shape. You know, other things you can always improve on. I, I feel like that goes hand in hand with that. For sure. We actually have a, um, because injury is such a big deal, we actually created uh, five or six worksheets specifically for injury recovery because a lot of athletes get injured and they don't know how to deal with themselves. They, they don't know how to deal with being off the mat and um, they don't tend to utilize that time productively. You know, I, I remember when I tore my ACL and I was in college, I, I didn't know who I was. Like, I can't wrestle. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> and, you know, I wish I had the ability to put an action plan on how I'm going to get better while I'm hurt. I wish that... I had some sort of, you know, how to view this as a positive experience. Why was this the best thing that ever happened to yeah, me? Yeah, I, I think that goes hand in hand with resilience, you know? It's a, it's a point. good way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, and these are all things that, you know, through utilizing mindset training, we can give these to kids instead of hoping that they realize this when they turn 31, 32 like us. Yeah, so pre-match, was there something that you did specifically before you wrestled that was kind of the same all the time? Like, did you have a specific a clear and specific pre-match routine um when i was younger it would have been listening to headphones and listening to music and getting all pumped up with that um and over time it kind of evolved to now now i focus on the only the things that i control um i, I have a, a a little bit of time where i'm just sitting with my thoughts after i get my good warm-up in before the match i'm just going through in my head what makes me successful or what has made me successful um, and that's just simple technical things, knees bent, always circling, moving my feet, um, engaging the guy, but doing it smart. Um, I think that's, that's what I run through my head right before my matches. And it really helps calm my nerves.
Um, when, yeah. when, when you talk about the physical warm up that you do, what does that look like? Um, it's, it's pretty, it's not that long. It's really intense. Um, just really breaking the sweat and getting that first match out of you. I, I feel like kids think that they, if they don't do a good warm up, they'll have that much more in, in practice or in the competition. And, uh, it, it actually backfires a lot of times. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah, you see it firsthand. Um, a, a good warm up is should be that first match out of the way, and getting your heart rate up that high so it doesn't it doesn't take that long to to get there again. Um, if you roll out of bed and you think you can wrestle a match and your heart rate's at fifty five, wild to get to the pace it needs to to fuel your muscles, you know, physical things like that. Um, I, I I do a short warm up just hitting some of my best holds. It's usually inside a half an hour, 40 minutes max. Um, and it, it's just jogging, stance in motion, hitting some executions of my best holds. And then just a lot, uh, not a lot, but a couple of wind sprints and push-ups and hand fighting just to make sure you really get your body going. I like being in a full sweat, um, being winded. I mean, my lungs should be dead tired. I should be gasping for air by the time that warm up's over. And then I can cool down for, I can rest for a half an hour or however long it takes before I'm out wrestling. But I think that's really important. And I think a lot of, a lot of wrestlers overlook that. So that sounds like a, well, I got two comments for that. One, it's funny that you mentioned like waking out of bed and what your heartbeat might be, what your, you know, uh, uh, your heartbeat might be. They did a study with Andy Bezik and his resting heart rate without warming up was like 52 and then when he would walk onto the mat, he'd be about 120. He typically would not start attacking until 170. So those of you, those of you wrestlers that, you know, kind of like bounce a couple times and shake your arms out and try to look cool for five minutes and think you can wrestle, you probably went from about 50, 60 to maybe 80, 90. Yeah. You're, you're still half the heart rate that you need to start attacking. Yeah. yeah so. That's, that's a good, that's a really good point. <laughs> that's good that they did a study for it. Yeah. I mean, because now, now you can back it up between, Hey, listen, I don't care what you're comfortable with. You're not able to get your maximum output unless you are firing at all cylinders mentally and physically, you need to be a little bit tired and you need to, you need to push your body through. So that leads me into the next part about it. So you gave a really good, a really good example on how to do this as a, um, kind of like for the first match of the day what about when you compete three or four times what does your pre-match routine look like in between in those you know quarters semis prelims rounds you don't have to do too much other than getting the right mindset your body's already been going depending on when the last match was obviously if it was six hours ago i'm gonna have to probably redo a a condensed version of my first warm-up um but usually at like i'm thinking of like midlands where you have a match every hour or two um, or a tournament like that, where you have a match every hour or two uh, where it's a mindset. Then your body's been going, it's just doing a little bit, you know, maybe a five minute stance in motion with a handful of attacks and down blocks and re attacks and just your best holds. But in a condensed version of that is, uh, is what I'd be doing in a long day with multiple matches. So it's funny you said that. So we talk about, you know, we give a specific pre-match routine to our clients and it has five elements. It has uh, dynamic stretching, an element of fun, uh, drilling and hand fighting, deep breathing, and then the thoughts that you're going to, the, the exact thoughts you're going to uh, tell yourself before you compete. And in addition to that, we give them a shotgun routine, a five minute or less version of that full 30 minute routine. So you know, we typically tend to encourage wrestlers to do that when, hey, man, you thought you were on deck. You thought you were, you know, had 30 minutes. All of a sudden you're on deck. Well, you got five minutes to warm up. What are you going to do? Yeah. That's so that. having a condensed version of that routine, whether it be for small amount of time or just, hey, man, I just wrestled 45 minutes ago. I don't need to warm up again for 30. Yeah. Yeah. That's really that's really good. I need some of that for my athletes. <laughs> Can you I mean, me think about stuff? it. Well, if you uh, remind me after we get off the phone, I'll, I'll uh, send you the pre-match routine and you'll see, like, I had a kid, it cost him the semis at Fargo because he, he didn't make it to the mat on time. He freaked out. He didn't have, uh, 
he didn't have but like three minutes to warm up and he's a very big on his warm up. So this was just one of the kids on the Texas national team. And, uh, you know, he's in the quarters and he ends up taking eighth because yeah, you, got, you got to be able to respond to adversity too, you know? Yeah. But I think the key is what we tell them is to pre-plan for adversity. That's what the shotgun routine is. Is like, Oh, I only have five minutes. No problem. I don't have got to pull it. this one out of my butt. I got it. I like that. I like yeah. That. So Greg Jones, you remember Greg? Um, I don't. Really. Greg was a three-time national champ from uh, West Virginia. And he is my partner for uh, martial arts mindset for all the UFC fighters and the Bellator guys, stuff like that. And he is a grappling coach now down in Florida. He wrote an article with me. You know, we write, we write an article every week for Flow Combat. And we wrote an article about um, nervousness, about how people have this perception that once you get really good at a sport, you stop being nervous. And that's complete BS. Yeah. And that – if you're not nervous, something's wrong. Um, you know, the, the hero and the coward, I say this every, every single podcast, the hero and the coward feel the same thing. The difference is how they respond to it. So tell me, do you still, when you were competing, did you still get nervous and how did you deal with it? Oh yeah. I got terribly nervous. Um, yeah, I, I still would get nervous. If I had to wrestle now, I'd still be nervous. Um, I know how to deal with it a little bit better now, but, um, so how do you deal with it? I, I talked about it earlier. I just focus on what I know where I've had success before. Um, getting to my hold, staying in my positions where I'm best. Um, that's, that's really important. And, and running those through your head right before you go out on the mat, you know, that's what you gravitate towards when, you, when you're out there competing as long as you're focused on that. And I think that that's, that, that's, that's what I do. Um, that helps me clear my head, calm my nerves, and uh, really focus on the task at hand. Absolutely. I think that's great advice. Um, what do you think would be your biggest regret in wrestling? Not trying to – well, I'd love a reshot at, at uh, my Olympic match, but uh, not, not taking the easy way out when, uh, when you know – what is right? And I'm thinking of my uh, national finals match. I, that, I guess that's all I'm thinking of. I've tried stalling a handful of times in my life, and never have I been burnt that bad in that match. And uh, that's something that I know is wrong. And I, I wish I, I wish I could redo that one for sure. I bet. I bet. Um, now you know. I mean, I'm sure you'd want that match back. I'm sure he wants your your trip to the Olympics. So you know. <laughs> I guess you trade. Yeah. Um, the, we talk about a lot the importance of gratitude. And the Sandersons, Kale, Kyler, and Cody and all those guys, they talk how that's the mental edge at Penn State is an attitude of gratitude. So what are your thoughts on the impact of being grateful when you wrestle? And what are some things that maybe you're grateful for? I'm, I'm grateful for the coaches and the people I had around me. Um, I, I couldn't be more grateful for him. And I think that that was, that is something that helped made me who I am. Um, you know, you're grateful for all the experiences you have and looking back at it, I, I can be grateful for, you know, the losses that I had that really burned me that, you know, dug in deep those, uh, being able to learn from them, even when they're, they're not the most fond memories, I think is, uh, is something that at looking back you can be grateful for and try to try to learn from. For sure. Um, so the last thing that we always ask people uh, that are on the podcast is what would you consider to be your mental edge? Um, I would, I would say self-focus. Um, I, th I think, I think that's, that's really important in knowing Knowing where you're weak and where you're strong, I think, is, uh, is something that, as a wrestler, really, really helps me and helps my edge. I think that is my edge. Being able to be self-aware, knowing, knowing what you're best at and knowing what you're not best at, how to accentuate and maximize your potential. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you again, uh, Dan, for taking the time to talk to us today, guys. This was a ton Thanks of great. Thanks for having me. You guys do a, you guys do an awesome job, and I I, uh, I really do want to be using your material as as our outline for our club. And I think you do a phenomenal job at developing that 
that edge. Um, it's, it's one of the, it's the most important thing in wrestling for sure. Yeah. I think if you can have an edge, I think every single high level wrestler would agree. It'd be the mental edge. Cause it's not the fastest. It's not the strongest. It's not the slickest. It's not even the most technical. Nope. Do you have it between the ears to make it happen when you need it the most? Yep. I agree. Awesome, Dan. Well, thank you again. Hey, how do we follow you on social media? Mr. Wildman, who doesn't like social media? Yeah. Uh, CapstoneWrestling.com. Uh, girlfriend's in charge of running all that stuff. So she does a phenomenal job. You can get a hold of register, get a hold, get any information. Um, emailing me at capstone wrestling at gmail.com. All right. And um, anything else on any, any other social media handles that are, that are good for us to follow? No, I kind of try to keep limited there. Um, I think we, we got Twitter up and Instagram, um, and just uh, that website. So you can log on or, Follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Awesome. Remember, guys, uh, follow Dan, follow his journey, follow his club. And if you want to follow us, I'm at uh, Wrestling Mindset at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can follow me at Mindset underscore Mike, both on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure that you sign up for your free trial session at WrestlingMindset.com. Mention Dan Dennis and you're entered to win a special, uh, a special prize. So, Signing off for today, this is Mindset Mike coming to you from Houston, Texas. Dan Dennis out in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Thank you guys again, and make sure that you stay tuned for this podcast and next week's.